today I'm going to be talking about, um, you know, uh, the challenges and opportunities to attain reproducibility in data science, right? And why is this important? This is important because uh, data has really transformed our society in many different ways. Uh, if we look at science, every scientific domain has moved toward data-driven exploration, right? And we got into what uh, Jim Gray termed as a fourth paradigm, where we went from hypothesis testing to hypothesis generation through data exploration. Uh, companies are capitalizing on data, and many companies, their main business actually comes uh, from the data they collect and process, right? So it's not surprising that uh, data has been touted as the new oil, right? And uh, last but not least, government is increasingly using data to become more efficient, to inform policies and the decisions that comes with these policies. And uh, all of these actually have been enabled uh, by this perfect storm where we have computing that is free, we have storage that is free, um, and we have lots and lots of data now available to every data, everybody, right? Data has been democratized. Uh, I argue that uh, the main problem we have now is that the bottleneck of actually uh, leveraging these data and computing actually lies with people. And the reason for that is, uh, yes, we have lots of data that's great, uh, but they come from many different sources and they have different levels of reliability. Uh, to get insights from data, we need to assemble complex computational processes. And these are hard to build. You need to have knowledge of algorithms, machine learning, statistics, visualization, data integration, uh, data cleaning, etc. Right? And this problem is compounded by the fact that, uh, you know, uh, as you explore data, uh, this uh, is an inherently um, uh, iterative process where you get data, you perform some computation, you look at the results, you understand, try to understand what's going on, and from that understanding, you go ahead and you change your uh, computational pipeline, build other data products, and so on, and you keep doing this in an iterative fashion, right? Like, for example, you get some data, you need to build a model, you first have to clean the data, you cluster the data to get a sense of what the data looks like, you create a visualization, uh, uh, you find issues, you clean the data again, you create your initial model, the performance is not that great, you go ahead, you know, transforming your data even more, visualizing, refining your model, oh, you got a good result, 92%, um, then you rerun your model, you get a 0.75%, uh, and behind your bag, unbeknownst to you, your system administrator updated scikit-learn, right? So now you get a result, you don't know if you use the right version of the data from all the different versions that you have cleaned, or if it was update, the update to scikit-learn that actually impacted your results, right? So this illustrates one big issue that we have now, which is in all these exploratory, data-driven exploration uh, processes, uh, they require lots of steps, iterative steps. And after you go through many of these steps, uh, you know, it's very easy to get lost and not remember exactly how you got there. You got great result. How did you get there? Uh, things can break, even behind your back, with libraries, with different versions of files, with people changing data behind your back, right? Uh, and in the end, the results you end up with can be very hard to understand, interpret, and trust. Right? And then when you go from this tortuous path from data to knowledge and eventually to decisions, um, you need to trust it because incorrect conclusions based on these kinds of analysis can lead to bad decisions. Right? And uh, what I claim is that in order to address these challenges, you need to be able to systematically capture provenance for everything that you do with your data and all the computation steps you follow. So what is provenance? This is a term that is widely used in art and archaeology. It's the source of origin of an object. It's the history of pedigree and the, uh, a record of the ultimate derivation of an item through various owners. Right? When you move to uh, computations, um, uh, computational provenance can actually be thought of as a causality graph that models all the processes and data dependencies, and I'm going to give you an example, right? And uh, the, these are actually key ingredients for one to obtain uh, transparency and reproducibility of your computational results, right? So if you look at that uh, crazy multiple-step uh, example that I gave you, this is a more accurate 
uh, um, depiction of what actually happened. You start with some data, you clean the data, you create a new version of the clean data, you do your clustering, and you generate a new data product, which is what you end up visualizing, right? But then the first, the version one of the data, you clean it again, you create a different version, now you create a different model, which is actually another artifact, right? So here what you can see is that, uh, you know, this process can be complex and has lots of different dependencies. You have these data dependencies, right? Like for example, the final model that I created depends on everything that happened beforehand, right? In particular, there are dependencies on uh, other data sets, the input data, the clean data, the clean data the second time around. Um, and you also have, sorry, process dependencies, right? In order to run the, a model, you first must clean the data in this example multiple times, or uh, if you're trying to visualize a particular data, it has to be cleaned before, right? So provenance, uh, in the computational sense is a causality graph. And what are the benefits of having this graph? One is that uh, you can interpret and reproduce the results. And this is really important today, as I said, when you make decisions based on data. You can understand uh, the, the whole experiment and the chain of reasoning that was followed to produce a particular result. Uh, you, because you have the whole tray, you can also verify whether, you know, whoever did the experiment uh, follow the acceptable procedures. You can identify inputs to an experiment where they came from. And if you find out the particular data set is bad, right, you know what derived results you can actually invalidate. Uh, very importantly, you can also rerun and reproduce the results by, you know, re-executing the steps. And you can do that also by varying other parameters so that you can obtain trust, right, and see if what you have is actually robust, right? This also helps you debug your results. If you find a problem, can you figure out whether that was a scikit-learn or it was the wrong data version that you used to uh, run your model? Uh, and last but not least, this is really key if you actually want uh, not only to share, but also reuse the work that you've done in the past, right? So when you look at the uh, provenance um, in science in general, like if you have biological experiments or social experiments, it can be really hard to replicate a particular study, right? But when we have computations, they are actually uh, carried out in a controlled environment. So in theory, it's actually possible and should be not too hard to systematically capture what happens in a computational environment, right? But then the question that you have to ask is what should you capture? And the answer here depends on what you use the provenance for. Right? In some cases, you just want to document the computational process, have maybe a textual description of what you went through. In some other instances, you want to be able to rerun what you ran before, uh, or even share that so that others can run in different environments. And uh, of course, you may want to be able to extend, modify, and uh, you know, assess the reliability of the results. Right? So one question for you is, uh, why do we talk about that? all of this if, uh, you know, yes, we already write programs, we can use a Jupyter notebook, and this, you know, captures detailed description of your analysis, right? So here I have an analysis that I did on New York City taxi data, and I have my whole notebook, right? Um, is this enough to get reproducibility? Okay, so uh, what I could do is uh, go to um, my browser, and if I can find it, oh, okay, maybe I can, uh, oh, Anaconda. Oh, I have it here, text analysis, right? It's already here, and, um, this is a, you know, I, I can try to run it again. Fine, I'm gonna read my taxi data. And boom, it doesn't work anymore because I have a new laptop and the data is not in the path that I had specified for my notebook, right? So there are some little details we need to worry about even when we use tools like Jupyter that uh, 
are supposed to enable you to attain reproducibility, right? And just to give you an idea, recently together with collaborators and the student, uh, we at analyzed uh, almost 1.5 million notebooks that we collected from GitHub. Uh, and uh, out of these, uh, we were able to uh, uh, extract uh, a little bit over a million that are valid. And here, valid means that uh, they have a defined Python version and an ex execution order. And the results, uh, you know, to me were surprising because only 25% of this 1 million actually executed without errors and only 4.57% uh, produced the same results as the original notebook, right? And, uh, you know, in the paper we describe a number of problems that, uh, you know, these notebooks have and uh, one is that people don't specify the actual versions of libraries they use in their notebooks. Uh, like in my taxi analysis, lots of people use hard-coded paths. Um, there's also a problem with outer order cells, right? That if you re-execute it, you're gonna get, you know, incorrect state. And you have also this issue with hidden states, right? So even in a tool that is supposed to help people work in a reproducible way, you can have serious problems. And with Jupyter, uh, you can try to avoid these by following a set of best practices like using relative paths or external data repositories that can live and work across different compute environments uh, before you commit and uh, save your notebook to uh, Git. Uh, hub, you, can, you should rerun top to bottom uh, so that you know that things are consistent. You should declare your dependencies and library versions and use a clean environment to test the dependencies, right? Um, and this is, you know, all fine and dandy, but, you know, if you're just doing data exploration and you're trying to figure out, uh, you know, you arrive your new hypothesis and you're trying to figure out uh, the next steps, right, all of this sounds very hard uh, to do. And uh, often you're left with a notebook that you've worked for several months and uh, how do you make that reproducible? So one alternative is to use this tool that we developed called ReproZip. Um, and the way that ReproZip works is that it has two steps. If you have a notebook or if you have a Python script or an interactive application, uh, you can actually pack uh, that application in a um, uh, uh, container that has all the necessary dependencies for that application to run in a different environment, right? So you pack and then you can actually unpack it in different environments, Windows, Linux, Mac OS, and so on. So what are the advantages of using such a tool? Uh, it actually automatically tracks all the dependencies uh, in an environment and will set them up in a different environment so you actually get this portability and allowing others to use or even yourself to use it in a different computation environment that deals with all this variability that is uh, uh, ubiquitous in uh, computation environments. And it enables you to attain reproducibility in hindsight. So I will show you well, with the video how this actually works. But under Underneath, what ReproZip does is that it relies on ptrace. And as you run your application, it will automatically check everything that gets called, all the files that are read, including put files, libraries, and so on. Uh, it will generate like a bill of uh, shipping bill, right? Everything that was used. It will analyze its provenance and will generate a configuration file that you as a user can, can actually edit and uh, customize what gets packed. And uh, last but not least, it generates this package that contains all those uh, dependencies. Uh, in the unpacking step, you can, you, you get this, uh, the, the, the RPZ file that contains all dependencies. Uh, and it will unpack that in, uh, you know, many different ways. It can unpack if you use a compatible operating system in a directory, or you can use a virtual machine such as Vagrant, Docker, and many other unpackers. And this is one point, point where the system is extensible. You can create unpackers for different kinds of environments. So how does this work? And here's a short video that shows uh, how you, uh, we're packing a Jupyter notebook. So this is just a notebook uh, that we use as an example. Uh, and it's for uh, brain analysis, for brain imaging, um, which is actually a domain that people have been using this tool quite a lot. So the way that you pack this is uh, you simply call ReproZip, as you can see there, uh, Jupyter in this case, and you trace the execution. So what this is gonna do is that it's gonna, you know, call Jupyter, will run top to bottom, 
And uh, that's ha that happened at RepoZip as tracking all the dependencies. So it, now it created a configuration file, and now it will package all the different dependencies. Okay. Uh, so now that you have this RPZ, and this was done in a Linux machine, right? We can go to a Mac, uh, and there we do repro unzip, and we are going to be doing uh, unpacking on Docker. And uh, what this is going to be doing is going to be creating this Docker container with all the dependencies in them. And we can then run that Docker container. And we're going to get the exact same uh, notebook that we got um, uh, on Linux. And here's the notebook here. Okay. So unlike my notebook, if I had rep used RepoZip, you could actually rerun all the different steps. Okay. All right, so uh, we've also done a Jupyter extension that you can install, and uh, instead of calling RepoZip, uh, you just uh, click on the little button on the top right in, in Jupyter, and it will actually pack that for you uh, much more easily than when I showed with the command line. So what can RepoZip pack? It can pack uh, scripts, uh, software, anything that you ca can call from the command line. It can pack graphical tools, interactive tools, client server applications. In fact, uh, we've been doing recently a lot of work on packaging uh, uh, news apps. Uh, uh, the uh, Jupyter Notebooks, it says very soon, but it's done already. MPI uh, experiments and many more, and you can see uh, more examples in uh, this uh, link here. Right? Uh, so another uh, tool that we developed is uh, this uh, called Repro Server uh, that uh, allows you to run any packaged experiment, uh, any experiment patched with RepoZip, just using a browser. Right. Uh, so if you guys have seen Binder, this is like a similar idea, except now that you can actually uh, also capture state. Right. Um, so the idea is that you can just you know, point your uh, browser to the RPZ, the RepoZip package, uh, and it will create the environment in your browser, and it will allow you also to uh, modify parameters, input data, and so on, and rerun that on the fly. And this whole infrastructure is set up in a way that you can deploy it in, uh, in Amazon or Google Cloud or in your own uh, computational environment. Okay, so I, I'm gonna skip over this, but I'd be happy to tell you more about this during my office hours after the talk, okay? So uh, tools like, uh, you know, uh, RepoZip, or if you document your code, uh, you document the provenance of your experiment uh, through your code, uh, is great, uh, and it works when, you know, for individual components of an analysis, right? But as we've shown before, an analysis can contain several different steps that you iteratively go through uh, during the exploratory process, right? So, and you know, one of them here, like maybe clean data, I'm using Jupyter, maybe to visualize I use a third party tool, maybe I create a model using uh, um, PyTorch or some other, you know, machine learning uh, uh, package, right? So one challenge is, you know, how do you actually capture all these different steps that can actually happen in different tools and in different environments, right? Uh, and as I said, you know, because these all happen in a computer, it should be possible to capture uh, the, the whole, the details of all, the whole exploration process. And uh, we've actually developed another tool called vStrails that uh, will automatically capture, uh, you know, a complex exploration uh, that is carried out within a workflow system. But unlike in the previous talk that talked about um, uh, production workflows, this workflow system here that we created is to support data exploration and data analysis, right? And the idea is that that will automatically and transparently capture all the steps that you uh, follow through. So you can start with a, a simple workflow that uh, plots a, a histogram, and you can, uh, you know, add data, you can try different visualizations like a scatter plot, for example, and you keep doing that, and uh, essentially the tool keeps this history very much like Git, right, but for data analysis, right? 
Uh, and uh, what we've shown is that uh, such a tool not only enables you to attain reproducibility because every node here is one state of your analysis that you can re-execute. Uh, but it also uh, has many benefits that go beyond reproducibility. Uh, first and foremost, it supports reflective reasoning, right? We humans have limited memory. You can remember, you know, five, six things at a time. Uh, and when you do these analyses that have, you know, potentially hundreds of steps, it's very hard for us to remember where we've been. But by having this history, uh, you can actually go back a few steps and, uh, you know, think and, and reason about all the different paths that you've actually followed. Um, you are able to uh, more easily and accurately compare different results, like, for example, the different models, the model that ran and that have different uh, uh, F measures. Uh, when you look, and this is a different example where I'm actually creating different visualizations for the visible human, I look at these images, they look slightly different, but what are the real differences behind them? And by having this detailed provenance, exploratory provenance, I can actually look at the different workflows that generated those images, and I can see that uh, on the left side here, in uh, orange, uh, this visualization is actually uh, uh, using isosurface, and I have here contour filter, whereas the one on the right side is uh, using volume rendering. And I can see exactly that, you know, the right one uses these three orange blocks, and in the right one, uh, you have the blue box that replaced the orange blocks. So you can see, you can see the differences visually, but you can also see uh, the steps that the, the the, the difference in steps that led to the different visualizations. Uh, and behind this, we actually have an algebra, which I don't have time to get into, but that uh, also enables you to compute these differences in a very efficient way, even for very large workflows. Uh, this model also allows you to uh, uh, systematically explore parameter spaces. So you can check, in this case, for, the, for this visualization, you can check different uh, values for your ISO surface, and you can see what effect it has on the final visualization. But the same mechanism can actually be used for you to explore uh, different methods to do your uh, analysis. So here I used um, uh, 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 as a surface, contour, uh, the, the, I visualize the, contour, uh, the contours of the images, but I could very easily change my analysis and uh, use volume rendering for all of, of them. So you can not only explore parameters, but you can explore different modules or different functions. Uh, and last but not least, uh, just like the way that we use Git for collaboration, uh, this also provides support for multiple people and big groups to actually uh, collaboratively analyze data. Uh, and this is an example of a real uh, uh, exploration that was done with folks that the work, the orange ones are in Utah and the blue ones are in, uh, sorry, uh, at University of Washington. And they were looking at um, uh, simulations of um, uh, the river, the Columbia River in uh, Pacific Northwest. Right. Uh, another thing that we showed is that uh, even though we use this um, uh, provenance model for a uh, exploratory workflow system, the model is extensible. It can be used to instrument other applications to capture similar kind of information. So we use the same methodology to uh, instrument Autodesk Maya, which is an interactive tool used uh, to build three-dimensional models and widely, it's widely used in the gaming industry and movie industry. So the same kind of functionality that we had in Vistrails is available in Maya. Uh, we also did that for a couple of systems that are used to do visualization, scientific visualizations that, and, uh, that are used at DOE labs. Uh, and also another tool that's using by NIH to visualize, I think, cell data or something like that. So just to give you an idea, here's a replay of, uh, you know, the provenance of exploration for an artist that was building the model for a plane. Right? So this was all captured while the artist was building the model, and you can replay and see step by step what the artist did uh, to build that particular model. Okay, sorry. Okay, so uh, you know, just one final thing. Uh, so I, I mentioned to you that uh, we developed this provenance model for Vstrails. We implemented it and uh, uh, built this plugin infrastructure that enables people to instrument other kinds of applications. Uh, and more recently, we've uh, uh, evolved this idea 
to actually capture uh, exploratory provenance for notebooks, right? Uh, so I wanted to do it with Jupyter, but the code base was too complicated. So we ended up building our own notebook called Vizier. Uh, and essentially, you can think of Vizier as a data-centric notebook that keeps track not only of everything that is executed, all the different states, uh, everything what happens in the, in the notebook, but more importantly, it also manages the data and all the different versions of data that are manipulated by your notebook. So, uh, as Wes said, I would need another talk to talk about all these things, uh, but uh, you, you can, you know, look for more information uh, in this URL, and uh, again, I'd also be happy to talk to you after the, uh, the talk. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to talk about is that, uh, um, as I said, provenance is key for one to um, build trust in results. But it's also a necessary component that to enable one uh, provenance and reproducibility to enable people to debug their, their data analysis pipelines, right? So here's an example of a, a simple machine learning pipeline that you read some data, you uh, split uh, the training and test, you build an estimation, an estimator, uh, you compute score, and you have the final score. Right? Um, and here is uh, the, the provenance of different runs that we had for this particular pipeline uh, using different, uh, you know, estimators as well as, uh, you know, different library versions for scikit-learn. And uh, one interesting thing that you can see by analyzing the provenance is that, you know, there's uh, two cases here where the uh, score is actually very low and the execution fails, right? Um, and you know, how do you figure out what is causing these failures in this very low score, right? So the ability to actually rerun these pipelines enables us to automatically figure out a set of parameters and what to vary in these workflows so that we can automatically detect what the causes are. Right? Uh, so in this case, uh, we ran our algorithm and it actually found that the problem here is not that it's gradient boosting versus decision tree, but it was actually a bug that was introduced in the scikit-learn uh, version 2.0. Right? Uh, again, you know, we have details of uh, this work in a paper that was recently presented uh, in, in uh, the Sigma GIM workshop. Right? But again, the, ability, the, the, the availability of provenance and the ability to rerun can actually greatly simplify the process of debugging and building trust in um, the analysis results. So to conclude, uh, I hope I have convinced you that provenance and reproducibility are necessary for data science. They enable data scientists and data enthusiasts uh, to build uh, trust on their own work. Uh, and uh, also it can help others trust the work that you do, right? Uh, for a long time, people have argued that they don't do things in a reproducible way because it's hard. We no longer have this excuse. There's lots of tools, not only the ones that I mentioned today, but you have, you know, virtualization, you have Git, you have a number of uh, great infrastructure nowadays that makes the process of um, uh, 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 creating reproducible results much easier than it used to be. Uh, and there's also simple best practice that if you follow, you can attain reproducibility. Uh, one caveat is that, you know, in, many, in some cases, full reproducibility is not possible, and that happens when you have proprietary code or when you have proprietary data or when you use very special hardware that is not uh, widely available. But even in these cases, there's some way that, uh, you know, at least part of your work can be reproducible. Right? And it's important to actually uh, ensure that the part that is possible is actually done correctly. Uh, and uh, recently we've seen a lot of uh, uh, attention uh, uh, to the problem of um, explainability, fairness, and ethics for data science. Right? Uh, and uh, you know, again, provenance is a key component for that. How do you explain the results that you have? How do you explain, how do you prove that you know, your model or your analysis is not biased versus gender, uh, uh, religion, and so on and so forth, right? So this is, I think, a very uh, interesting area. There's a lot of ongoing work, ongoing research in developing techniques that use provenance to uh, actually um, uh, support explainability and better debugging for these pipelines. 
Uh, and finally, you know, I urge you all to practice re reproducibility. It's uh, good for everybody, but especially for you. Thank you so much, and I'd be happy to answer questions. I have a question. Um, so in, uh, in research uh, right now, are people um, running any of these processes by hand to make sure that the results are reproducible, or is this completely, like, it's, it's, it's not a thing that researchers really think about at the moment? So, uh, so at least in science, uh, and there's a recent report by the National Academies that I helped author, uh, it's actually a requirement. Anything that you publish, any, it's not science if it's not reproducible, right? So uh, there is already j journals, conferences. Uh, when you publish a paper, it's expected that you also provide your code, your data, so that others can reproduce. And a number of these venues have already established procedures where people will verify, will rerun and verify whether the results actually are consistent to what is reported in the paper. Right. Are those generally consistent? Or I'm sorry? Are, are the results generally consistent? Uh, so there's no uh, real study that shows whether the results are consistent. I've been helping uh, with one conference, and oftentimes they are consistent. Very few times it happened in this particular conference, ICM Sigmod, that uh, the results were not consistent. And but sometimes there had, had to be like a back and forth with authors because sometimes they didn't, the authors didn't provide the exact parameters and so on to run the things, right? 